Hi. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started since it's 11 and a ton of slides to go through. Thank you for being here. Again, right now we're competing with Sono Games. Um, I know it's getting exciting and interesting. We're going to go over the best disaster medicine literature of 2016. Um, there are no conflicts of interest to report. I apologize my co-presenter could not make it. Um, so just a little bit of background about this project. It's been a collaborative effort between the SAM Disaster Medicine Interest Group, the folks at Asper Tracy, which is a group within the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Responses Office that's looking at sharing information on research and best resources for disaster medicine, and the NIH Office of Research Services. We put together a literature review basically to say, what's the best disaster medicine literature that's out there, and how do we get it to people who are practitioners and academics in the field? Because we know it's pretty broadly published and sort of spread out in a hard-to-find way. The first step was to define disaster medicine. So the definition we used was an area of medical specialization serving the dual purposes of providing health care to disaster survivors, survivors and providing medically related disaster preparation, planning response and recovery, support and leadership regardless of the causative hazard. So it's a pretty broad definition with hopes, the hopes to be all encompassing to guide our literature search. We actually had a medical librarian do our literature search, so I think it's a little bit better than it might have been if it was just me sitting down at PubMed. Um, they took one disaster medicine term and one healthcare system term, and articles had to meet both criteria. We looked at articles published between January 1st and December 31st of 2016, English language, human studies, and we uh, included hu original research, reviews, commentary, concept papers, and case reports. They also hand searched the following journals that you can see up here, and then specifically searched these great literature resources. So the search terms that we used are here on this slide of plenty. I apologize. It was very hard to make this any more legible than it is. They took one term from the green side of the disaster medicine and one term from the orange column of healthcare systems. If you'd like to look at it in more detail afterwards, I'm happy to zoom in on it for you and we can talk about if you think we missed a term. I think we were pretty thorough. The actual search terms themselves took about 30 pages if you wanted to go through the mesh terms that were searched. Um, essentially, we had five project team members who did a review of the literature and then went through it and went through titles and abstracts to determine if it was a disaster medicine concept related to the healthcare setting and then referred to a disaster, natural disaster, terrorism, or infectious disease. Each article was reviewed by two team members, review, resolved by a third reviewer if there was conflict, and then went to another set of reviewers to determine relevance. After that, they found that any articles that met those inclusion criteria went on to be scored. Articles were divided into categories of original research, case reports, commentary, or concept papers, and reviews or meta-analysis. These were assessed on clarity, design, ethics, importance, impact, and overall impression, and these were scored in a maximum overall score of 20. The articles were independently scored by two reviewers. A third reviewer stepped in if there was a discrepancy of four points or more between each article. A score of at least 16.5 out of 20 allowed an article to be proceeded to final review, which essentially categorized it as one of the best articles of the year. So in summary, about 1,600 articles were identified during the search. Eventually, 347 articles were specifically scored. And of those 347 articles, 18 articles were selected as the best articles of the year in disaster medicine. So what are the details of these articles? Nine of them were case reports, seven were original research, two of them were reviews. 11 of these were found by database searches, five in the gray literature, and two by specific hand searches of the journals. A sort of 10,000 foot view of what the disaster medicine literature looked like in 2016, which I think will apply to last year and to the coming years ahead. Most of the literature was found to be pretty anecdotal, potentially li limiting applicability to broader applications. Disaster medicine as it's used is a pretty broad, poorly defined term, as we all know if you practice or work or teach in disaster medicine. A lot of articles used mathematical models that were based on inappropriate clinical assumptions, which made their outcomes not as usable. A lot of articles also, also drew overly broad conclusions from available information, which led to recommendations that weren't actually supported by their data. Many articles also didn't consider substantial previous contributions in the same area, so while ignoring prior research, limited the impact of their conclusions when they could have built, high, built higher. And we found that essentially we felt defining specific data sets and comparative metrics would help in da disaster data collection and measuring preparedness interventions. So that's sort of the 10,000 foot view of what's going on in the literature. But let's get into the details of what the actual best literature was that year. So the 18 highest scoring articles included four reviews of recommended best practices, three focused on man-made intentional events, three retrospective reviews of earthquakes, two that looked at frameworks to address gaps in structural reprodu reproducible research, two focused on the recent Ebola epidemic, two dealing with mental health effects of disasters, one looking at the creation of ED observation units, and one looking at regulatory requirements for healthcare providers and suppliers.
So we're going to do about a 30 second overview of every article and then we're going to do a deeper dive into four of the articles specifically. So after Ebola in West Africa, unpredictable risks, preventable <coughs> epidemics, this is published in the New England Journal. It was a high level review of the recent Ebola outbreak that revealed that effective management of the next outbreak will essentially require committing resources to both strengthen national health systems and sustain investment in the next generation of vaccine, drugs, and diagnostics. And we may be on the verge of seeing that if we've made those investments effectively or not. The second article, CMS and Disasters, Resources at Your Fingertips, put out by Asper Tracy, was a document that highlighted several different methods by which organizations can meet the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services emergency preparedness requirements for Medicare and Medicaid participating, participating, sorry, participating providers and suppliers' final rule. The third article was part of a series, Research and Evaluations of Health Aspects of Disasters, Part 6, Interventional Research and the Disaster Logic Model. Published in Pre-Hospital and Disaster Medicine, this article in the series describes a detailed process to initiate and evaluate interventional research studies in the disaster field. Our fourth article was from the same series, using the model to provide a framework to guide research efforts that study the effects, outcomes, costs, and impacts of disaster interventions. Basically, I highly recommend that you read this research series if you haven't read it yet. The fifth article, Access Denied, Delivery of Critical Healthcare Products and Personnel to Disaster Sites, was put out by Healthcare Ready. It was a report that offered a review of emergency site access challenges by ex experienced in the private sector, as well as summaries of programs le and legislations by state. Potential solutions and program recommendations were provided. Our sixth article was part of the Hartford Consensus literature. Essentially, this was a summary and call to action for a response to active shooter and intentional mass shooting events. It discusses training and implementation of a plan to increase the ability of bystanders and professional rescuers to respond to such events, focusing most notably on hemorrhage control. This is part of the literature that supports the concept of stop the bleed, which at this point I think many people are aware of. Number seven, so how to steward medical countermeasures and public trust in an emergency? a communication casebook for the FDA and its public health partners. This is a resource document casebook developed for the FDA, providing guidance on how to communicate medical countermeasures to the public in an emergency. The eighth literature, piece of literature was EMT's Minimum Technical Standards and Recommendations, put up by the WHO. <coughs> this builds on the classic blue book and is a guidance document by WHO Working Group focusing on minimum standards and requirements for EMTs and providing rehabilitation services after large-scale disasters. Our ninth document, also put up by the WHO, looked at non-communicable diseases and emergencies. It was a brief intended primarily for emergency planners, professionals, and policymakers tasked with emergency preparedness and response. It provides a brief, brief overview of the impact of non-communicable diseases and disasters and describes the minimum standards and emergency actions to be adopted in relation to those emergencies. Our tenth article is Observation Services, linked with an urgent care center in the absence of an emergency department, an innovative mechanism to initiate efficient health care delivery in the aftermath of a natural disaster. Keep your titles short, guys. This is really long. Um, so published in Disaster Medicine and Public Health Preparedness, this article demonstrated the usefulness and diverse population base that can be cared for in an ED observation unit after the emergency department at NYU after Hurricane Sandy shut down. So this is based on a model that actually was practiced. The eleventh article, Vulnerable But Why? PTSD Symptoms in Older Adults Exposed to Hurricane Sandy. This review found that PTSD symptoms were much more likely in elderly persons affected by Hurricane Sandy who had lower levels of income, lower positive affect, low levels of employment, and other factors that would allow for targeted interventions to increase pre-event resiliency and promote post-event recovery. The twelfth article, Civilian Casualties of Terror-Related Explosions, the Impact of Vascular Trauma and Treatment and Prognosis published in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. Vascular casualties from IEDs were causing, found to cause more complex casualties who have poorer prognosis. This has implications for the triage of victims with such injuries and selection of receiving hospitals. The 13th article was the post-nuclear disaster evacuation and survival amongst elderly people in Fukushima, a comparative analysis between evacuees and non-evacuees. Elderly residents evacuated after the disaster experienced a three-fold increase in mortality compared to baseline mortality in the control group. This potential impact essentially should be taken into account when deciding to evacuate a facility or not. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper in this and the other articles highlighted in red. So a new paradigm of injuries from terrorist explosions as a function of explosion setting type. Published in the Annals of Surgery, this is a retrospective review of terrorist-related blast injuries from the Israeli National Trauma De Registry from 2000 to 2005. They essentially looked at injury patterns in the setting of the blast, looking at space injuries found inside buildings, near buildings, inside buses, 
near buses, and in open spaces. They looked at 823 cases from 65 separate events and sought to compare the severity of the wounds and type of wounds that were found. Essentially, you can see in the graphs on the left, it's a little bit hard to see, but the, the highest column is closed spaces and both both graphs, the top one looks at injury severity score of 16 or higher. The bottom graph looks at an injury severity score of patients of 25 or higher. They found that the more severe injuries were found when explosions occurred inside a building or inside a bus. They also found that the lowest severity of injuries occurred when explosions were found near a bus. The lowest volume of, ex of injuries occurred in open spaces, and the highest volume of injuries occurred near buildings, which supports the concept that a blast wave would reflect off the building wall and potentially impact more patients. They also found differences in injury profiles depending on a closed space versus an open or semi-open space. The most dominant injuries in buildings were found to be extremities, head or neck, or abdominal injuries. Inside buses were space, extremity, or head or neck injuries. Near buses were found to be extremity, external head or neck injuries. Near buildings, extremity and face injuries. And in the open, extremities and abdominal injuries. So the reviewer who saw this article said it was a simple yet elegant examination of blast injury patterns based on the setting of the explosion. The results of the study allow for a great deal of predictive capability and concerning injury severity and scores and resource utilization in blast events with known settings. And it may lead that the setting of the explosion, it may lead to the fact that the setting of the explosion could be one of the pieces of information relayed to the hospital prior to victims arriving. The next article we're going to look at is a change in gears. We're looking at the increase in avoidable hospital admissions after the Great East Japan earthquake, published in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health. They found that early interventions could reduce avoidable admissions during acute conditions in the months following an area impacted by a natural disaster. So the objective of this study essentially was to look at the effects of the earthquake and subsequent tsunami and nuclear disaster on long-term health conditions in the area. They looked specifically at what are ACSCs, or ambulatory care sensitive conditions, using a national inpatient database in Japan. When they looked at patient populations, they essentially found what we already know, that preventable injuries and chronic injuries increase immediately after disaster and then immediately decrease as care is provided in the area. They however found that avoidable admissions due to acute ACSCs remain high in the long term after the earthquake and tsunami. These are essentially conditions where early intervention could prevent a serious progression in need for hospital admission. They increase significantly to 3.3 admissions per 100 in their population. So if you're wondering what are ACSCs, so there are 19 ambulatory care sensitive conditions commonly used in the National Health Service in the UK. The preventable conditions are influenza and pneumonia and other vaccine preventable conditions. Chronic conditions are categorized as things like asthma, CHF, COPD, diabetes, hypertension. And the acute conditions that they were talking about in this study are dehydration and gastroenteritis, pelonephritis, perforating bleeds or ulcers, cellulitis, PID, ear, nose, and throat infections, dental conditions, seizures, and gangrene. Essentially, this analysis highlights that while we've seen in prior reviews a spike in acute conditions and chronic conditions, these acute ACSCs provide an area where early interventions may prevent the need to actually admit people to hospital spaces. Our 16th article in the review was Disaster Preparedness and Response Improvement, a comparison of the 2010 Haiti earthquake-related diagnosis with baseline medical data. This article was a comparison of pre-event and two years post-event diagnoses of patients compared with those seen up to one month post-earthquake in the same location, published in the European Journal of Emergency Medicine. The next article we're going to dig deeper into is Effects of a West Africa Ebola Virus Disease in Healthcare Utilization, a Systematic Review. This essentially was a review of the literature that indicated that non-Ebola-related increases in morbidity and mortality in West Africa were due to a decrease in services available and a decrease in utilization of those services at baseline. Sorry, that graph's a little bit small. When we talk about indirect effects, we're specifically addressing an increase in maternal morbidity and mortality, a reduction in HIV-prevented patients receiving antiretrovirals, an increase in malaria patients due to termination of increased intermittent preventative treatments, fewer children being treated for diarrhea and acute respiratory illness, and a decrease in hospital inpatient admissions and surgical care in the area. This meta-analysis looked at over 3,000 articles and eventually narrowed in on 22 studies. Ten focused on HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Four focused on outcomes in patient admissions and surgical care. And 11 looked at reprodu uh, reproductive and maternal health and pediatric issues. The review essentially excluded non-English speaking articles and articles related to the direct effects of the Ebola virus and articles related to mental health. Um, the takeaways were fairly obvious in what we would assume, but it's nice to see that it's been documented. Maternal case fatality rates were higher than normal. The number of C-sections and utilization of 
uh, maternal care services decreased, the number of admissions and surgical procedures done decreased, there was an increased rate in malaria, there was a decrease in preventative HIV services delivered, and there's a decrease in treatment rates for malaria based on medications drop, distributed in the space. There's also a surgical site in Sierra Leone where 25% of the surgeons died to Ebola virus disease. So we can see direct links as to why resources were not available in the space. So it's a strong systematic review looking at health systems in the area. It was limited by the fact that Guinea, which is a French-speaking country, if they had any French-speaking literature that was published, French-written literature that was published was excluded from the study. They also sort of diminished what the full impact on this health systems were by not addressing mental health issues in the review. But they did reinforce the fact that we know caring for patients in areas affected by Ebola virus put a strain on systems and it was to the detriment of communities that were involved. It also indicates the need for better tracking and reporting of these types of issues during similar public health events. You can't just track your Ebola patients or your SARS patients. You have to keep track of everyone else who's affected in the area. The last article that we're going to discuss today is a systematic review of health outcomes among disasters and respond humanitarian responders, published in Pre-Hospital and Disaster Medicine. This is a meta-analysis of the research on the physical and mental health effects to responders in major disasters. It concluded that responders' health, both mental and physical, needs to be better assessed after disaster work, which is a topic I think that's become near and dear to everyone's hearts, especially in the, the effects of the last year of multiple disasters and multiple responders going to multiple events in a row. So essentially, this was an analysis of over 2,800 art abstracts that got boiled down to 66 articles looking at the health sequelae of various responders to different disasters. They found that PTSD and depression were common in responders after disaster events, and that physical health were pro problems were reported, but much less studied. So 57 of the 66 articles were on psychological impacts and only a handful on actual physical health injuries. PTSD was reported in up to 34% of responders, and depression in up to 53% of responders. Physical health problems included both acute injury and chronic disability resulting from disaster response activities. And the authors essentially concluded there was a need for better post-disaster health surveillance of responders for both physical and mental health issues. So it's a critical issue that's only been poorly addressed in the literature, but disaster responders do suffer bad outcomes from their work, and it's not limited merely to injuries that occur on site. It's critical to screen and follow disaster responders pre and post event to make sure their health needs are being addressed and preserved and supported as much as possible. So, Special thank you to the Disaster Medicine Interest Group, the folks at Asper Tracy, and the NIH Office of Research Services. If you have an interest in participating in the 2017 review of literature or those moving forward, or if you have comments or things you want to see addressed in the methodology, we're happy to have you join the group and work on the project. We recommend that you join the Disaster Medicine Interest Group, and then feel free to email myself or Eric Ronick, who are co-chairs of the group, to get you involved in the study. Um, at this time, I'd like to take any questions or thoughts from the audience. Literature speaks for itself, obviously. <laughs> Sorry, I know that was really rapid fire, but I think especially because the disaster medicine literature is not very widely distributed, we didn't want to only tell you about four of the articles. We wanted you to know what the other pieces of literature were out there that were, were sort of floated to the top. Um, but what this review essentially told us was that the biggest gap is that we all as an academic body need to be better researchers, stronger researchers, and put out literature that's higher quality and has higher utilization and, and applicability to spaces. A lot of the literature reviewed was very well done, was very methodological, but when we looked at actual impact or usability or downstream effect of the literature, it was pretty weak because it didn't put new information out in the space or wouldn't change practices that are already in place. So I hope that this motivates those of you who do disaster medicine research to be better about it and those of you who don't to recognize a space where you can be publishing and working in the field. Thank you.